Thanks a lot. Yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for kind uh, introduction, uh, but basically uh, this award that uh, it, it was not me personally uh, who received it, it was the institution that I represent, the Agricultural Research Center. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, friends and guests, uh, uh, thanks for coming in this uh, pretty early morning and for me. Um, and I'm really honored and first let me uh, express my deep thankfulness to to the organizers of the conference and personally to Natalia Georgadze for having me here and for having invited me with a keynote speech which I decided and proposed uh, and I entitled uh, as a Trespassing Europe towards the new international, international in the sense of internationale. Uh, and I will, uh, I will try somehow to outline um, the current uh, status quo on a global scale that I would argue is a reactionary or counter-revolutionary one, not in, only in Ukraine, but in beyond Ukraine, around Europe and on the global scale. And my, my talk today will consist of uh, two parts, and somehow in both of them I will try um, to depict what I would call the political unconscious of, of the present day. Mm. And uh, somehow I will be shifting from the first part to the second part, uh, trying to find and to propose some possible ways to, to move from political thanatos to political eros, from nightmare to daydreaming, I would say. Meaning that uh, we have uh, to somehow to make a really radical political and societal shift from what we have now, but need to overcome and to go to what we are aimed at. So that's why um, I decided to, uh, to entitle it as a trespassing Europe, because it is something that has to be trespassed. Because uh, I do think that today uh, we live in the age of uh, a structural crisis of global institutions, when the maintenance of uh, transnational status quo nowadays on a global scale mm, is being constructed on violation of borders, raging peripheral wars, and the emergence of new walls and conflicts. And in this sense, my country, I'm coming from Ukraine, shares a lot of challenges and, and threats with the whole EU, which is uh, shaking of the established territorial parameters and protection mechanisms, shock of the war, mass displacement of people, rise of the flows of refugees and the so-called internally displaced, mm, shrinking of its territory after Brexit, and the rise of the far-right populism, when Europe nowadays became a battlefield for a new type of terror. And uh, we can say today that, uh, paraphrasing famous uh, American philosopher Alan Bloom, that we are observing the closing of the European mind. Mm. Because Europe today functions as a market automat. Uh, in, it's being ruled in a, in a technocratic way, without even having a common discourse. We can say that Eurozone has somehow abducted uh, Europe as such. And politics in, in, in Europe is substituted by police. When protecting border, borders, policing borders, protecting inside from the outsiders became the main task of the whole constellation. That's why I think that uh, what is really needed and lacking in this kind of constellation is political discourse, political imagination, or political dreaming, if you want. And uh, in this, in this situation, I think, if we really think about the future of Europe, we have to question the neo-colonial mode of relationship between the European metropolis and its periphery. And uh, uh, in order to do that, uh, we have somehow to, we are aiming and discovering some political potential in the context of the bigger Europe, in the context of the outside of Europe, what is perceived today as being outside. And in this sense, the idea of cross-border unity and really functioning international solidarity appears to be of the highest urgency for the survival of Europe in the future. 
That's why I will be pointing at the development of a newly, de newly emerging collective subjectivity grounded in international, in democratic internationalism, which can indicate a possible exit strategy from the current deadlock of economic crisis, nationalistic populism, and war conflicts nowadays. So, uh, the first of all, first of all, Europe today is overshadowed by the war, by warfare. And, uh, that's why I, I, uh, I called uh, the current status quo a counter-revolutionary one, because as we know, historically, the warfare as such is one of the forms of a counter-revolution. And in this situation, several years ago, I remember it very well, one had to argue that this war is aimed at Europe, that this war is against Europe. Now, after Trump, after IFD in the German parliament, after the Freedom Party in Austria, after Brexit, it became a common sense yeah, that it is anti-European war somehow. And uh, what I know also from my experience in, in Ukraine, in speaking institutionally and unfortunately also personally, uh, that uh, if you have the warfare, you cannot live in peace. This war is sometimes called a hybrid war. And it also, what we observe currently, it's also a hybridization of the peace. Europe is also living in a hybrid peace. It's not a positive peace, it's a negative peace, so to say. And uh, one of the indicators of that is the change of discourse, is the emergence of the new Orwellian new speak. Sometimes it's fashionable to say today that we live in post-truth world. I would rather say that we live in a pre-truth world, in the world where truth hasn't arrived yet. And this uh, new type of Orwellian new speak is a really a very, a very, a very crucial symptom for that. Because uh, when, when war starts, war becomes peace, and peace becomes war, as Orwell basically predicted. Now this Orwellian new speak is really defining our world, our linguistic and political world. Because peace becomes, wa uh, becomes war in this pseudo-Hollywood uh, parallel reality, fictional parallel reality, in which we were forcefully placed uh, uh, in. And in this world, real peace is war, fascism is presented as anti-fascism, as we know in, in the Russian context. Uh, uh, revolutions are presented as coup d'etat, yeah, as we know it from Ukraine. Refugees are presented as danger, and of course Trump is the president of this kind of a world. It is a really existing, deadly fiction which is poisoning with its populist virus our different European context. That's why I think it's really very important to follow the politics of truth, so to say. That is very precious today, at least to be honest, to name things with their proper names. And the problem with the warfare in regard to the European Union is that uh, for quite some time the EU was based on the following princi principle of governing, which was which has been and still is somehow, exterior, exteriorizing the conflict, pushing them to the outside in order to keep the inside safe, in order to protect the center, some imaginable center. But this logic of governing has fallen as we see it today. And one of the symptoms of that is, the, is the, basically the breakdown of the Schengen system. Now, in, inside the European Union, we see the emergence of new walls in a range of, for example, Eastern European countries, when a lot of countries started to build new walls. So, what was inside became, uh, what was on the outside became inside. What was externalized, what was keeping a distance beyond the, beyond the European wall became inside. And somehow, terror threat is, always, is also an indicator of that, because uh, it is always the return of the repressed, to put it in psychoanalytical terms. What was, if you have the warfare outside, you would have terror threat inside. And that is basically uh, what the main lesson somehow to be drawn from the history of the Roman Empire. If you conduct war, wars in the borderlands, in the peripheries, you, you, you would never have the metropolis safe and stable. It will fall unavoidably. 
So uh, that's also an indicator that the whole accent, the whole emphasis is today shifted into the peripheries. Now we see that Europe is somehow surrounded by a belt of wars in its south, like Syria, or in its east, like Ukraine. So war is coming closer and closer to European doors. And somehow today, Europe has to somehow draw itself back to its establishing roots, like after the Second World War, in, in, the, in the circumstances in which the first basic intention to establish something like the European Union was to prevent the war after the atrocities, after the total burn down, after the Holocaust, after the, all the atrocities of the Second World War, it was the main task on the table. And we still see it today that this task is still on the table. To prevent war, to stop war, is still the, one of the most important tasks for the European w Union. And uh, it's basically not even the war, what is usually called war on terror. It's because uh, war on terror means just two things, more war and more terror. It's rather a metaphor of very radical, severe and harsh and uh, violent transformation of our societies during recent years. And uh, basically we have the new generation which was raised and born in the world of the war on terror. They just don't know another world. They live only in this world. The whole world became the, uh, like the war on terror. A look at ISIS. I would even say that if ISIS didn't exist, it should have been invented. Because uh, it's so comfortable nowadays to have our common enemy that it's so comfortable to hate altogether, to, to find a legitimate neg negative common ground for all of us. Like, if you really want to understand what is ISIS, look at anti-ISIS coalition. It's uh, like a new Noah's Ark of nowadays. Every, every creature, every politician ha has found his or her place in there. Like you see, Trump, Theresa May, Putin, Erdogan, Macron, everybody is there. Everybody is there. So what we basically see in Syria today is a global war on a local scale. It's a really like the Gopsian war of all against all. Because in Syria, the West is fighting ISIS, Russia is fighting the US, Sunnis are fighting with Shiites, Arab states are fighting Iran, Syrian opposition is fighting Assad, the Kurds are fighting with the Turks, and the EU is, as always, fighting with its ghosts. And the main cliché has already been coined. It's the world community fighting international terrorism, which is incom impre incomprehensible, is fighting with unconceivable. That's why I think it's the first principle to overcome the current ni political nightmare, is to stop the war. Yeah. That's the first task to be achieved. Secondly, it's about the wall. Unfortunately, we can say today that the idea of the wall, the matrix of the wall, still remains the basic principle of the European politics. Because contemporary world intends to present itself as totally globalized, networked, and integrated. But it looks like this only in a polished and shiny neoliberal discourse. But in fact, it's the world of new walls. Not to mention new idea of Trump about the wall and uh, the, uh, the old walls that still exist. But as for Europe, we can say that somehow the Berlin Wall didn't fall. It just gained another form. So to put it metaphorically, not all the bricks from the Berlin Wall went into muse to museum. They were transformed and used to build another wall. And we can see really a very in interesting and symptomatic trajectory in this sense. When Europe moved from the idea of the Berlin Wall to the idea of the Schengen Wall, yeah, which just uh, shifted to the east and still is on the eastern border of the EU, separating a totalitarianism-free space from the post-Soviet space, as it was fashionable to say some time ago, where you can still find its remains, meaning totalitarianism. But now, uh, the, this idea from the Schengen Wall is shifted to uh, the idea of new Europe, of new walls. Now Europe itself became the territory of new walls. And uh, in this sense, if we really want to re rethink and reconfigure Europe and the, the tradition of its democracy, we have to put this anal analysis in a re real political condition and take into account this divide, yeah, this, uh, this border that still 
borders that still exist. We can recall here very famous slogan which was widely used at the rallies in Mexico. We don't cross borders. The borders have crossed, the borders have crossed our lives. And I'm also speaking uh, beyond the wall. Yeah, I'm from the country which is on the other side of the wall, on the dark side of the wall. Yeah, so uh, I'm also somehow presenting the experience which is uh, not typical for, for the inside. But in fact, the EU from its very beginning was, was supposed to overcome the historical division of Europe and political isolation of the Eastern Europe. But this dream of borderless Europe was falsifi falsified and betrayed. Europe became a fortress with a barbed wire to the outside. And uh, that's why it's also a question of political optics, so to say. Because if we think about Europe, it depends what place we are thinking from about it. Because if uh, there, there are basically two Europes we live in today. The one is progressive, polished, very fancy, uh, civilized, and the other one is a second-hand Europe, is a barbaric, totalitarian, yeah, which is on the outside. So, uh, and this border, it's also very important to emphasize, is not just imaginary, it doesn't exist only in minds, but it, it's very material, it's physical, and it uh, has its traces in our experiences. And it's very interesting type of discrimination, we can say because it's based not like old-fashioned racism on anthropology and not even on social ground, but it, it is based on the idea of citizenship. Like, think about it. Because some people from some countries, mostly, of course, poor, poor people from such countries, are treated as if they are of a lower class, of a lower race. Like, look who is standing in the lines, in the airports, in the embassies, only the so-called colored or the post-Soviet people, like the second or the third class people. It's just because they belong to, a, they, they, because of their country of origin, because of their citizenship. And that is also one of the important processes that we have been observing recently, what is usually called in the mainstream media refugee crisis, which is totally a misleading term, of course. Because we don't have a refugee crisis, it's a cri European crisis, it's a cri political crisis. The warfare itself is a crisis, is the main crisis. But uh, this process, I would say, can be really uh, very nicely described by a famous uh, Marxian expression, what was solid melt into the air. Because uh, we, see, we observe the process in which terra, territory, ground, soil, earth, becomes water, it flows. When, that's why territorial borders are somehow dismantled in this sense. Refugees, they displaced, escapers from the warfare and asylum seekers are melting borders, are shifting territories, are the center in Europe, by the way. That's why we see these new walls being emerged, solidifying uh, new borders inside Europe. And uh, that is a very important process because refugees which, who came to Europe, who came to the EU countries, they basically brought new global fresh air. They are very, making a very important job. They are decentering Europe. So we can say that the times of Europe as a resort have already finished. And it's probably a good sign. And the figure of a refugee uh, itself is a key for today. We can even say that Europe itself is a refugee. Let's recall this famous Greek myth uh, of Europe who was raped and abducted by Zeus. Afterwards, as we know, her three brothers started to, uh, to, to search for her, but none of them has found her. So Europe is always like Shechelle Femme. It's missing element. It's always absent. It's somewhere on the horizon. And in this sense, we can also recall this famous manifesto by Hannah Arendt, We Refugees, where she writes, in the first place, we don't like to be called refugees. We ourselves call each other newcomers or immigrants. These are the people who are reclaiming Europe, who are making new Europe somehow. Because what we basically observe is the new spring of the peoples. People coming from different sides, different kind, uh, countries, are changing Europe onward. And those 
who have been sleeping on the streets at the rail railway stations, who are al also based, what an irony of history, in the, on the territories of the former concentration camps, who are chased and arrested by police, who are welcomed by tear gas, who are dying in the Mediterranean Sea, which, uh, which turned into a graveyard of Europe. These are newcomers, new citizens of, Euro of Europe. You like it or not, but they are already here. They won't leave. Their children will stay as well. So, to put it simply, new Europe is being born. That's why the second position I would like to emphasize is no more walls. Sadly, it's about memory. That's really a crucial dimension of the current global constellation. Because apart from conducting wars and building new walls, Memory is a kind of an ideology of this counter-revolutionary status quo. Uh, it, is, it presents a discourse which smoothes uh, the, the basis of this con uh, constellation, this memory discourse. And what is really paradoxically that memory politics has nothing to do with history. It's not about how to remember, it's rather about how to forget. Memory is another side of the coin which has fear on its other side. In, in comparison to the, uh, to the hybrid war, we can say that we are talking about hybrid memory as well. <coughs> so if you look at the back, uh, at the experience of the recent years, at the different kinds of revolutionary uprisings which took in, uh, in different countries throughout the globe, starting from Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, Indignados movement in Europe, and uh, finishing with Ukrainian Maidan, that was already mentioned. We can treat them whatever we like, and maybe they were naive, but altogether as such, as a political phenomenon, they were aimed at some utopia, at the future. They presented the politics of hope. But today, this revolutionary utopian politics of hope is, uh, is turned into reactionary post-apocalyptic dystopia, war in Ukraine and Syria, ISIS, far-right populism, again, Brexit and Trump, all of these present the politics of ressentiment without any vision of the future. Quite the opposite. We are today obsessively concentrated on the past, on memory wars. We are acting out our frustrations through history. History in this situation became the main hostage of, uh, of this kind of memory wars. Repression and regression became the system of coordinates of our current uh, uh, constellation. It is repression of emancipative political potential and regression to barbaric, sub-political, radical discrimination. The main question probably to, to be asked uh, for today is how could that, could that be possible that in all those contexts that had and presented some really emancipative potential for radical societal change, again, like the, in the Arab countries or like in Ukraine, now all these contexts are at the warfare. So warfare itself uh, tends to be a really very functioning and radical antidote against, uh, against change today. In this sense, the warfare substituted the revolution, the, the revolutionary hope. And uh, it, it also turned out to be that we are living somehow uh, that's why this revolutionary hope was abandoned, because uh, we forgot about the future. The war is the best way to forget the future, and the past is what, it, what remains when future is forgotten. So somehow, paradoxically, I, I would say that we are to living today after the future. Yeah? That wars are always about the past. They always pretend to solve some antinomia or aporias of the past. And uh, revolutions are always about the future, about some hopes and visions. So war is a poison how to stop the future, how to finish the future, how to forget the future. To put it in, a, I would say, political linguistic term, terms, we are living in past continuous time. time. We forgot about pa uh, future continuous. We, we, we are being left in only in the past continuous time. But in this situation, when we forgot about the future and are so obsessively concentrated on the past, it, again, it's not about history. And it's even not about memory. This past is pretty often based on false memories. I was, uh, we, we, are, we pretty often feel nostalgic 
for what has never been happened at all. I already said that, but it's really very important. Listen to the main slogan of all populists today, to this famous Trumpian, make America great again. The main word here to be asked about is again, because everything else is just populistic bullshit. So what, was that, what is that again? What does he really mean when he says again? When America was great in the past, what does he mean? Is it about the 30s or the 50s? The thing is that this again has never happened. That it's a total fake. It has never existed. It, it has, it's not about history. It's about false projections on the past. So it's, uh, it just shows the backwardness. This isolationistic backwardness is a dead end in the even in ontological sense, I would say, because it has never been there. Yeah. It's just fake, yeah, fake itself. That's why the third political task, I would say, for today is remember the future. Yeah. Today we are also, uh, the other, other panels of today also aimed about talking about the future. I hope I will also contribute to that. So, shifting to the second part of my talk, uh, which is about, rather about political errors, as I called it. Uh, how, how political errors and how political alternative is possible, and what do, do we need for that? That is really very challenging and serious question, because uh, that is basically the, the way how to think about the poli really existing political alternative. And... Uh, Mm, it's a very serious task, of course, and uh, we have to be ready to meet an, uh, the unexpected, to, to put aside our political prejudice and to suspend our political stereotypes and cliches. Uh, because speaking from in, and also an institutional perspective, I would say that this question lies on the intersection of three basic realms or basic stones which are knowledge, art, and politics, which are reflecting three isms fundamentally important for the idea of the new Internationale today. So, first of all, I would claim that uh, the international is universalism. Re that is represent this principle is represented by the politics of knowledge. As a university teacher or university worker, I, w I totally believe that society has invaded places of knowledge, be it universities or any other educational institutions, in order to think about its foundations, to think and debate on the grounds that society is based upon, and to propose the social alternatives. And lack of the proper politics of knowledge in this sense, uh, lack of proper political reflection, leads to a rupture between the so-called theory and the so-called practice, in which knowledge into theoretical hallucinosis and political practice as we, as we observe it today uh, is being turned into vulgar cynicism. And humanities as such, critical theory, are really crucial for the idea of the political internationale because humanities, they are anti isolationistic in principle because they enable the manifestation of the universal, universitas, that is uni university as such, right? So, and also uh, being placed between the revolution, uh, revolution and counter-revolution, which is the warfare today, I think that enlightenment and learning is the best task to undertake under such conditions. It's the best antidote against counter-revolution, especially in the form of the war. Critical reflection and politics of knowledge are anti-violent. They are more radical even than violence itself beca because they, they stop violence. They, uh, th that's the best remedy against spreading violence. They cut off the channel of violence and, and they are able to overcome social darkness. Thinking and truth do not tolerate fear and threat. Freedom from fear is the basis for critical reflection. That is the fundamental political task of a famous owl of Minerva, which has to spread its wings with the falling of the dust. Because if it doesn't, if you don't have this politically critical reflective a posteriori, we would remain, as Hegel would put it, in the night of the world. So that's why, to quote uh, Lenin, learn, learn, and learn once again. Secondly, the international is modernism. Modernism as such 
by the way, as Europe as well, is an unfinished project which needs still fulfillment and accomplishment. It is a question about political power of imagination, how utopia is possible, which vision can project and outline our common future, because modernism has a strong political potential of thinking and inventing alternative societal projects, critically needed worldwide at the moment. Modernism is, means readiness to create utopias for social change, to search for political alternatives, and it's also an aesthetical revolution, emancipation of art and its ability to capture our experience in its wholeness. Having originated in Europe, modernism, by the way, like uh, the human rights idea, has spread throughout the 20th century around the globe. And it contains a very unique capability of being local and global at the same time, preserving its national particularity, specificity, along with the development of its international universality. That's why it's a really unique phenomenon. And that's probably the most important uh, political and aesthetical phenomenon in the history of 20th century. And what, is ob what we observe today, by the way, is overlapping of fusion of postmodern cynicism and pre-modern barbarism, when, uh, when uh, a choir of post-political wisdom is accompanied by neo-Nazi marches across Europe. And modernism in this con constellation is just abandoned, is repressed, is ignored. <coughs> but modernism is also about, about gaining uh, political subjectivity, because modernity means the birth of contemporary political subjects, which just don't have an, any other political subject apart from the modern one. And that's why it's not by occasion that uh, the main political event of modernism was, of course, the October Revolution, the centenary of which we, we are indicating this year, this month, basically. And it's not by occasion that all the avant-garde were constantly referring to that event. And this event, the October Revolution, is a crucial for Europe and for the future of Europe, by the way. I would call just uh, shortly one thing. What we see afterwards is European Feder Federative Republic, United States of Europe. That is what it should be. Only United Europe, as federation or republic, can give peace to the whole world. It is not Merkel, Tusk or Juncker who said that. It is Trotsky one day before the, uh, before the October Revolution. So, I mean that it's really very important that what, what Europe started to realize only after the Second World War, after all the atrocities, it was already on the plan in the context of the First World War. So, to some extent, we can say that United Europe was also a communist idea, and we don't, we don't have to forget about that, especially today. Sadly, my last point, the political international is about internationalism as such. And it's also the question of political subject that we can observe of, uh, during recent years uh, in, in different contexts, meaning the uprisings and, and political revolts in, in different countries. Again, if we think about uh, the Occupy Wall Street, Arab Spring, uh, Tahrir, uh, Maidan Revolution, in, all in general, what we observe is just the search of, of for a new political subjectivity, a new political collectivity, a new form of collectivity in politics, because politics is, of course, always collective. So the form it gained was the occupation of Agora, of a central square. So that was the political form of the subject of nowadays. And the idea of the square is really crucial, not only for politics, but also for cultural field because also representing the institution with a, so to say, a political awareness which is operating in the cultural field. It's, it's also, for all of us, it's very important to, to, uh, to, uh, to keep in mind that uh, uh, our institutions are also somehow the continuation of the idea of the political square, because they are also functioning as small squares, as, polit as public platforms, uh, as uh, aimed at uh, the broadening, at changing the public sphere, uh, broadening our agenda. But these revolts and uprisings also showed that movement is not enough, it's good for the start, but we need institutions. We need new institutions in order to broaden our agenda, to sustain ourselves in the future, and to prevent ourselves from dispersing 
to accumulate, to be present in as such for, as some formation. So I would say that the institution is a real estate of politics because it even etymologically originally means uh, something which is set up, which is put in place, which is arranged, which is uh, some, some formation. So in this sense, I think uh, that's the most important task, creation of the international cooperative um, of politically engaged institutions acting together uh, in order to conduct really transnational politics in spite of existing walls at the age of globalization. That is the Gesamtkunstwerk, that is the art piece we really need most today. So if there is any slogan relevant and of the highest agency for that and for creating really functioning international solidarity, it is this famous old one, proletarians unite. Yes, proletarians and cognitarians of art, knowledge and politics, those excluded and underprivileged, refugees and the displaced, unite. It is a long run, super hard and challenging task. And we are probably just at the beginning of this process. But, but if we will even think about moving that way, this very unity itself will be already our common victory. That is the task to be achieved. Thank you very much. I did it in time, right?